listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello, and welcome to the Becoming Who You Are podcast. In this episode, I want to talk about the art of conversation. I wanted to talk about this today because I think conversations are something that we can take for granted sometimes. So there are different types of conversations that we might have. We, we have repeated conversations with people we're very close to, people that we see every day. And we also have momentary interactions. For example, if we are at the checkout in a shop or we're asking a stranger a question or something like that. But every conversation counts, whether we're talking to a friend, a co-worker, a partner, or someone we've never met before. If we're not really aware of how important these conversations are, and if we do start taking them for granted, it can be tempting to be a bit lazy with our conversations. We might take it for granted that we'll have more conversations with a certain person, or perhaps we think that it doesn't really matter because we're not likely to see the person that we're talking to again. But everyone we come into contact with has an impact on us whether their presence is fleeting or life-changing, and we also have an impact on them. The conversations I remember most positively are those that leave me feeling warm, interested, and engaged, even if they seem relatively insignificant at the time. These conversations cover diverse topics and include discussions with loved ones and close friends, as well as short but fulfilling interactions with people I've met only once. Quite a while ago on the blog, I did a series of posts on asking for feedback, which included giving compliments, giving not so great feedback, and offering unsolicited feedback as well. With that in mind, I thought it would be helpful to talk about a few principles that we can apply to conversations in general. The principles that I'm about to talk about can be applied to every discussion we have, both with ourselves and with others. The first principle I want to talk about is to listen. This sounds really basic, but often we believe we're listening when actually we're doing or thinking about something completely different. We can't have a proper conversation with someone if we're looking at something online, if we're in the middle of a task, or if we're preoccupied with other things. True listening is about making a conscious effort to devote our attention to the other person in the conversation and our thoughts and feelings about what they're saying. Other people know when we're really listening and when we're not. For example, I remember going to a conference once where I was talking to a woman during a networking event and I had a really negative experience of her because the whole time we were talking, she was looking over my shoulder, looking at who was walking past and just obviously wasn't really engaged in our conversation and wasn't really listening for me. When I noticed her doing this, what I imagined is, oh, she's looking out for someone else to talk to. And as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to take the time to talk to someone, it's a mark of basic respect to give that person your attention during that time. And if you find your attention slipping away, to acknowledge that and say, I'm so sorry, my attention slipped for a moment. Can you repeat what you were saying? So how can we show someone that we're really listening? Well, we can do this by making eye contact, by giving genuine nonverbal cues, such as smiles, nods, frowns, in response to what they're saying, and by using verbal cues, such as "Mm mm-hmm, yep, or similar, when we think it's appropriate and when we feel is natural in the conversation. The second principle is to reflect. Anyone who's ever had any training in active listening or a listening job, for example, counselors or helpline agents, this is a really valuable and common tool in those professions that you use to show that you're listening and to help clarify what the speaker means as well. Reflection is about summarizing what the other person has said. For example, it sounds like you're feeling frustrated and helpless because you don't feel in control of the situation. In everyday conversations, this technique is best used sparingly and only at times when we think it's appropriate to either show we understand what the other person is saying or to check we're on the same page as them. When overused, reflection can leave the speaker feeling like they're actually not being listened to Or worse, like it's impossible to get a sentence out without someone parroting back to them what they've just said. But used again naturally and at appropriate times in the conversation, it can be really, really helpful for the speaker to have someone reflect back to them what they say because it helps give them, coming from someone else, it helps give them a new perspective on what they've been talking about. 
Principle number three is be honest. On a very basic level, honesty consists of two things, openness and self-responsibility. When we are honest, we are being open about our feelings and thoughts and we're taking ownership for them rather than blaming the other person. For example, honesty looks like, when I realized that you hadn't cleaned out the kitty litter, I felt annoyed. Not honesty looks like, no, everything's fine, I'm not annoyed at all. Not honesty also looks like, you made me feel annoyed because you didn't clean out the kitty litter. No one can make us feel a certain way. Our reaction is ours to own. Part of being honest is having the courage to take responsibility for our reactions and to be open about them. Number four, don't take it personally. This step can be really easy to forget, especially when emotions are running high. It's difficult to talk to someone who truly believes that you made them do something or made them feel a certain way because you did or said something. We might also find ourselves feeling offended by seemingly innocuous comments or those that seem to include a hidden message, especially if they touch on trigger points for us. It's hard not to take comments like these personally, but doing so can send the whole conversation into a downward spiral. When we hear comments we want to take personally, it's helpful to stop and ask, what exactly do I feel hurt or angry about? Does this remind me of something from my history? Could this be an innocent or well-meaning comment that is triggering feelings from the past? How does the other person seem to be feeling right now? Could they be trying to communicate how they're feeling without explicitly saying it? If it's a historical trigger, we can also ask ourselves, can I empathize with myself and how I'm feeling? Can I acknowledge feeling hurt or angry without acting on it? And if the feelings are based in the present, we can ask, can I give back ownership for this person's feelings to them? Is there a way I can proceed with the conversation without taking responsibility for how they feel? The last principle I want to talk about is take a step back if we need to. This is crucial during difficult conversations that have become unhelpful or destructive. When we stop enjoying conversations and don't feel motivated to carry on with them anymore, taking a break can help reboot the discussion and bring some perspective to the situation. Taking a step back from the conversation is also necessary if someone starts becoming verbally abusive or if we feel like we might become verbally abusive to them. Whatever the reason, verbal abuse is highly damaging to conversations and to the relationship we have with that person. The motivation behind this urge to say something abusive is rarely rooted in the present. It's a sign that we or they have been triggered and that a lot of historical feelings are coming up. Taking a break is necessary to work out what was going on, what the trigger was, and how we or the person who got triggered can be more conscious of it in the future. These principles originally came from a blog post that I published back in 2011 on my blog. I asked at the end of the article, do you have any more tips for having great conversations? What has really worked for you in the past? And I had some really helpful comments and response. One person in particular, who is a reader called Martin, added three points that I just wanted to add to the five principles that I've talked about first, because I think they are really valuable. The first one is don't just let it go. And he says, I want to stress the point that brushing things off under the, off the table under the carpet will not do well in the long run. And I think this is really, really true. I think if there are issues that need to be discussed or feelings that need to be discussed that aren't being discussed, this is such a breeding ground for resentment. And the longer that these things go undiscussed, the more difficult it could be to discuss them as well. He also suggests it may be useful to set a date to talk about it again. And I think this is, again, another really helpful suggestion if you are engaged in a conversation with a friend, for example, and for whatever reason you have to end the conversation, perhaps it's not being constructive anymore, or perhaps you both have other commitments that you need to get to or something. But it can be really reassuring for both parties to say, okay, let's make a day to talk about this next Tuesday. Let's meet for dinner or, you know, go out for a coffee or whatever, and we'll talk about this again. Because it provides reassurance for both parties that, we're not just going to let this slide, you know, we're not just going to let this conversation go and brush it under the carpet. I am committed to staying in a dialogue about this and it, our, the quality of our friendship is really important to me. So I think that setting a date to talk about it again is another great suggestion. He also says, have enough time to discuss it. Don't have any other appointments scheduled afterwards. 
And I would agree with, I'm not sure this is always necessarily doable, but I think the the important point that I take away from that is essentially don't bring it up when you know that you both either have limited time or limited emotional bandwidth to discuss something important right now. I would love to hear what you think about these tips and whether you would add any of your own for having great conversations. Thank you so much for listening today and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life.